Type 2 diabetes mellitus is a chronic metabolic disorder characterized by insulin resistance and relative insulin deficiency, leading to persistent hyperglycemia, meaning elevated levels of glucose in the blood. It constitutes approximately 90% of all diabetes cases worldwide, making it the most common form. Maintaining euglycemia, meaning normal glucose levels, involves a tightly regulated interplay between insulin secretion that comes from pancreatic beta cells in the islets of Langerhans and insulin sensitivity at target tissues, such as the liver, muscle and adipose tissue. Normally, in the fasting state, low insulin and elevated glucagon, a hormone secreted by pancreatic alpha cells in response to hypoglycemia, stimulates hepatic gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, ensuring a steady glucose supply to the brain and other vital organs. Postprandially, rising glucose levels in the blood trigger insulin release from the beta cells, with insulin ultimately serving to reduce glucose levels and promote nutrient storage. More specifically, the effects of insulin include increased glucose uptake in muscle and adipose tissue via GLUT4 transporter translocation, it stimulates glycogenesis in liver and muscle, which is the conversion of glucose to glycogen, the body's stored form of glucose. It inhibits gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis in the liver. It enhances lipogenesis, meaning fat synthesis, and inhibits lipolysis, meaning fat breakdown in adipose tissue. It also promotes protein synthesis and inhibits protein breakdown in muscle. And additionally, it facilitates cellular uptake of potassium, which is why it can be used as a treatment for hyperkalemia. In cretins, such as GLP-1 and GIP, enhance insulin secretion postprandially. These actions collectively contribute to insulin's anabolic effects and regulation of metabolic balance. There is also some renal regulation, which involves filtration and reabsorption of glucose, primarily via SGLT2 transporters, as well as contributing to gluconeogenesis. In a healthy state, euglycemia is maintained through this dynamic system, with normal values being 70 to 99 milligrams per deciliter, or 3.9 to 5.5 millimoles per liter, fasted, or postprandially, generally not exceeding 140 milligrams per deciliter, which is 7.8 millimoles per liter. The pathophysiology is complex and not entirely understood. However, generally arises when insulin secretion is inadequate to overcome peripheral insulin resistance, particularly in the liver, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. Defronzo's ominous octet illustrates the eight pathophysiological defects that contribute to the hyperglycemia. First is insulin resistance in muscle, because impaired glucose uptake leads to hyperglycemia, and hepatic insulin resistance, which leads to increased hepatic glucose output due to the failure of insulin to suppress gluconeogenesis. Overall, peripheral tissues become less responsive to insulin, necessitating higher insulin levels to achieve glucose uptake and reduce blood levels of glucose. There are multiple mechanisms leading to insulin resistance, including defective insulin receptor signaling and defects in glucose transport to translocation. Contributing mechanisms include chronic inflammation, elevated free fatty acids, and mitochondrial dysfunction, which interfere with insulin receptor substrate activity. The other large contributor to type 2 diabetes is beta cell dysfunction. At diagnosis, beta cell function is already reduced by 50 to 80 percent. Over time, pancreatic beta cells fail to compensate for increased insulin demand, leading to inadequate insulin secretion. This is believed to be due to chronic insulin resistance and hyperglycemia increasing the beta cell workload, leading to functional exhaustion and apoptosis, meaning programmed cell death, of the beta cells. Fourth is increased lipolysis. Elevated free fatty acids from adipose tissue worsen insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction. Fifth is decreased in cretin effect, 
where reduced GLP-1 activity diminishes insulin secretion. Sixth is increased glucagon secretion, which further increases hepatic glucose output. Seventh is increased renal glucose reabsorption, where upregulated SGLT2 transporters in the proximal tubules exacerbate hyperglycemia. The eighth of the octet is brain insulin resistance, which alters appetite regulation and systemic insulin sensitivity. Type 2 diabetes often develops silently and tends to be detected on blood tests incidentally. There can be symptoms linked to the chronically high blood glucose, for example polydipsia, meaning increased thirst, and polyuria, meaning increased production of urine. These both occur as a result of increased glucose leaking into the urine, pulling water with it, leading to more urine and ultimately dehydration. Though these are typically more common in type 1 diabetes alongside weight loss and fatigue. The complications, however, of diabetes can be severe and can actually be the first signs or symptoms of it. They are divided into macrovascular and microvascular complications. Macrovascular include coronary artery disease, for example, myocardial infarction, cerebrovascular disease, such as stroke, and peripheral arterial disease, such as claudication and limb ischemia. Microvascular complications include diabetic retinopathy, which can lead to blindness, diabetic nephropathy, which can lead to kidney failure, and diabetic neuropathy, including peripheral and autonomic neuropathy. These complications result from the chronic hyperglycemia, giving a combination of metabolic injuries, such as direct glucose-mediated endothelial damage, oxidative stress, and the production of sorbitol and advanced glycation end products, ultimately resulting in organ dysfunction. Endothelial dysfunction, oxidative stress, and chronic inflammation contribute to accelerated atherosclerosis, which leads to the macrovascular complications. As a result, common findings can include wounds such as cuts and grazes that heal poorly, recurrent infections, particularly fungal and urinary tract infections. There may also be neuropathic signs like tingling or numbness in the hands or feet, blurring of vision, and acanthosis nigricans is development of darkened patches of skin, typically around the neck or armpits, as a result of hyperinsulinemia leading to keratinocyte stimulation. Diabetic foot is another, which is characterized by infection, ulceration, or destruction of tissues of the foot associated with neurological and vascular compromise. Loss of sensation due to neuropathy can lead to unnoticed trauma, while poor circulation and immune dysfunction impair healing, overall increasing the risk of serious infections, gangrene, and in severe cases, amputation. Less commonly, patients may suffer hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, or HHS, which is characterized by marked hyperglycemia, typically above 30 millimoles a litre, or 600 milligrams per deciliter, leading to osmotic diuresis, where excess fluid is lost through the kidneys as a result of the high glucose, leading to dehydration and hyperosmolality. This is without significant ketoacidosis, which distinguishes it from diabetic ketoacidosis. This is because in type 2 diabetes, there is residual insulin activity, and so lipolysis and ketogenesis are suppressed. It is a medical emergency requiring fluid resuscitation and typically develops over days in response to illness, infection, or inadequate insulin. In 2000, global diabetes prevalence amongst adults aged 20 to 79 was 4.6%. By 2021, it had risen to 10.5%. As mentioned, approximately 90% of cases are type 2 diabetes. Modifiable risk factors include obesity, particularly central adiposity, sedentary lifestyle, unhealthy diet, smoking, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and a history of gestational diabetes or prediabetes. Non-modifiable risk factors include older age, family history or genetic predisposition, and certain ethnic backgrounds, such as South Asian, African Caribbean, and Native American. Additional associated risk factors 
include polycystic ovarian syndrome, metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease, psychosocial stress, depression, and the use of certain medications like corticosteroids. The diagnosis is based on evidence of elevated blood glucose. The World Health Organization criteria include fasting plasma glucose above 126 mg per deciliter, a plasma glucose above 200 mg per deciliter two hours after 75 grams of oral glucose, or glycosylated hemoglobin, HbA1c, above 48 millimoles per mole, or 6.5%, which is a measurement of the percentage of red blood cells that have glucose-coated hemoglobin, which gives an estimate of the glucose levels over the lifespan of the red blood cells, typically two to three months. In asymptomatic individuals, there must be a repeat or another test on a subsequent day, meaning a total of two abnormal results. Whereas in symptomatic patients, a random plasma glucose of 11.1 millimoles per liter or 200 milligrams per deciliter is diagnostic, or any of the above results. A diagnosis of prediabetes, which is where the blood glucose are persistently elevated, but not enough to meet the type 2 diabetes criteria, can be made with a fasting plasma glucose of 5.5 to 6.9 millimoles per liter, which is 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter, a HbA1c of 42 to 47 millimoles per mole, or 6 to 6.4 percent. Lifestyle modification is the cornerstone of type 2 diabetes management and should be initiated at diagnosis and maintained long term. Key changes include calorie appropriate diet rich in vegetables, whole grains, proteins and healthy fats while reducing intake of refined carbohydrates and sugars. Weight loss as a 15% or above weight loss increases the likelihood of remission. The direct study in 2018 showed that 46% of participants with type 2 diabetes achieved remission at one year following an intense weight loss program, with over 85% of those who lost more than 15 kilos achieving it. Regular physical therapy is beneficial independently of weight loss, and it is recommended that around 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise per week, alongside resistance training on two or more days. Smoking cessation is strongly encouraged, and structured diabetes education and behavioural support have been shown to enhance adherence and outcomes. Pharmacotherapy usually runs alongside lifestyle modification. First line, metformin is recommended for all adults unless contraindicated or not tolerated, such as renal failure or metabolic acidosis. If this is the case, then options include a dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor, also commonly called gliptins, such as alogliptin or linagliptin, a sulfonylurea, like liclizide, a thiazolidinedione, particularly pioglitazone, or an SGL2 inhibitor, like empagliflozin. Alongside this initial monotherapy, if the person has heart failure or atherosclerotic disease, or a Q-risk score above 10%, then an SGL2 inhibitor should be added. From here, most adults with type 2 diabetes the target for the HbA1c is 48 millimoles per mole, or 6.5%. This is the case when managed with lifestyle alone or with drugs not causing hypoglycemia. If instead it is treated with drugs that do carry a hypoglycemic risk, such as sulfonylureas, or they are using two or more anti-diabetic medication, the target is 53 millimoles per mole, or 7%. If this target is not met, an additional agent can be added to form initially dual therapy, and the medication added can include any of the four we've mentioned above. If dual therapy fails, then a third medication from the list can be added to make triple therapy, or insulin can be initiated. Beyond this, GLP-1 receptor agonists like tizepatide are considered, if triple therapy fails, especially in patients with a BMI of above 35, 